So welcome to our third lesson in our AF biology revision series. Uh, this one's also going to look at cell structure and function. I've already made a video, uh, I've actually made it for the year 11s that are going to be going on to doing A-level biology uh, on, on cell structure, so I'll put a link in the description for that video as well. Um, so I'm not going to dwell specifically on eukaryotic cell structure, instead what I'll look at is the methods that we use to actually study cells. We'll also look at um, prokaryotes, virus structure and also the cell cycle uh, in general. But first of all, let's look at actually how we, we study cells. So cells, as you hopefully fully well know, they are very, very small indeed, generally speaking. Um, they're not visible with the naked eye. So we have to use microscopes. Now the, the three types of microscope that you need to be aware of are the light microscope, the uh, scanning electron microscope and the trans, uh, transmission electron microscope. So the light microscope is the standard one that we use fairly regularly in uh, science labs. Also uses visible light to and lenses to focus the image to make it appear larger than it actually is. And that's what the idea of magnification, enlarging an image to make it appear larger than it really is. The concept of resolution is different. It's the ability to be able to distinguish between two points. So I could make, I could blow up a picture. I could take a, a picture off Google Images, and if I started to make it bigger and bigger, you would see that that image got blurrier and blurrier because it doesn't have the resolution. So although I might be able to magnify and make something look bigger, I might not necessarily get that good resolution and not be able to see it. And that's a limitation of the light microscope because visible light has a, a longer wavelength than electrons do when we get onto electron microscopes. That'd be important. Therefore, it's got a lower resolving power, uh, and, uh, and we also can't magnify as highly. But the one major advantage of using a light microscope is that you can get a colour image, so you can see the real colour of the object, the specimen you're looking at. You can also, because there's no vacuum involved, and, and only relatively simple uh, preparation, you can look at living specimens, and on many open evenings, if you've ever wandered around our school, you'll see me looking at Daphne, you know, little water fleas under the microscope, and they're still alive, you can even still see their little hearts beating, which is really quite remarkable. Um, and again, because the preparation is quite simple, and it requires some usually minor staining, we don't generally tend to introduce very many artefacts. So it's okay if you want to look at um, the kind of general shape of tissues and, and, and cells and things like that, but we can't see any specific high-level detail of organelles using a light microscope. With the invention of the electron microscope, it opened up a whole new world, a whole level of complexity of our cell structure. And, and you know, when you go from GCSE to A level, you, you, you really appreciate how much more complex cells really are, and it's electron microscopes that have enabled us. Now that's specifically the TEMs, which stands for Transmission Electron Microscope. How does that work? Well, all electron microscopes use electrons to create an image. Uh, you don't look down these things. Um, it's all sort of generated on a computer based on how the input from the electrons. But in order to get a beam of electrons to be focused, um, it has to be done in a vacuum because any air particles would scatter the electrons very easily. Um, so it has to be done in a vacuum. We've got a series of magnets which um, can focus the beam of electrons. And in the case of the transmission electron, those electrons actually go straight through the object. And depending on the specimen density, will determine how the image comes out. So darker areas on the image will indicate denser areas where fewer electrons are penetrated, whereas less dense areas, more electrons would have passed through. So uh, that's how the transmission electron microscope works. It's got the highest resolution and magnification of any of the microscopes we're talking about, and we can really see intricate internal details of the cell. That's an important thing to say about the transmission electron microscope. We can see detailed internal structures of the cell and even the organelles. We can even look in and look at things like the Christie on the mitochondria, really, really um, high resolution and magnification there. With the scanning electron microscope, a little bit different how it works. Instead of the electrons passing through the object, they hit its surface and scatter off. In fact, you actually have to put a very thin layer of gold over your specimen before um, you prepare it, before you start looking. And then an array is there that picks up all the scattering of the electrons, and that's what builds up the image. And what a scanning electron microscope does, it allows you to get a, a really beautiful 
3D surface detailed image of the object. And often when you see electron micrographs, these are images used, um, created using electron microscopes, it's often of the CEM. You know, you can see these lovely 3D external structures. So I wouldn't be able to see inside a cell, but I could see the outside of it really, really well. So they're the main types of microscopes. Let's look at look, some of the advantages and disadvantages of our uh, electron microscopes. So electron microscopes, um, again, their major advantage is they've got much higher resolution and magnification compared to the light microscope. Um, we can see considerably more internal details of uh, cells, particularly with the TEM, compared to a light microscope. For example, the light microscope, you can only see a handful of organelles. You can, you can make out the nucleus and that's about it, really. You wouldn't be able to see anything like the mitochondria or the chloroplast, whereas electron microscopes, we can really see those in, in considerable um, detail, uh, rough ER, etc., Golgi, that sort of thing. Um, some disadvantages now of the electron microscopes. Well, because it's using electrons and we haven't got any visible light, we've got no colour, it's just a black and white image, grayscale. So we can't see any true colour. Because it's in a vacuum, no living thing can survive in there, so we cannot see any living cells or organisms. Uh, they're always dead, unfortunately, so that, that does restrict what we can see and, and watch cells behave. Um, and because in order to prepare and get a specimen thin enough for something like uh, transmi uh, transmission electron microscope, you can often introduce what's called artefacts. So these are false objects through the preparation processes. There's complex staining, the thin sectioning, all that kind of stuff that aren't real, but they look real. So you might think, oh, this structure isn't naturally there. It isn't. It's purely an artifact of the process. It's obviously a lot more complicated, involves many more stages compared to the light microscope, and you have to be trained specifically on how to use them, which is another disadvantage. So that's a nice sort of overview of the types of microscope. Um, how would you go about working out how big something is using a microscope? Well, the first thing often that you get in the exam questions is some basic calculations, some basic maths. And it's a nice simple triangle to remember. And it's I am. So the I stands for the image size. And you always would measure that with a ruler. Make sure you measure it in millimetres. If you do it in centimetres, you can be out by a factor of 10. So I recommend always doing it in millimetres. The A stands for the actual size, the real size of the object. And that's typically for cells, going to be in micrometres. But you might possibly come across nanometres if we're looking at organelles or viruses or something like that, very small. But usually, nine times out of 10, we're talking about micrometres. And magnification is the M, and that is basically links the two things together. How many times bigger is my image size compared to my actual size? So when you're using any of these triangles, if it's in physics or biology or whatever, you always cover up the bit you want to work out. So typically, you're either going to be working out the actual size or magnification. So if I want to work out magnification, I'd cover it up, and I would do image size over actual size. Okay. If I wanted to work out actual size, I'd cover it up, and I would do image size over magnification, like that. Very simple. One other last little tip to mention here is, once you've measured your object, so let's do a very quick example. So imagine here's an image of a cell. Um, I've got some sort of scale bar here. It says that this is, I don't know, 20 microns across. What's the magnification? So that's what I'm trying to work out. Um, so what will you do in this case? Well, you would place your ruler on there, Go from the edge of that line to that line there. Use your ruler, measure it as accurately as possible down to the nearest millimetre. Let's pretend, let's say, in this case, it's 30 mil. Now, you'd be tempted just to go 30 over 20 because image size over actual gives you magnification. If you did that, you'd only get half the marks. So what you need to do is convert that distance into micrometres. To do that, very simple. Just multiply your, uh, your measured distance by 1,000. So that would give me... 30,000, like that. Now I would do my 30,000 over my 20, and that would give me my magnification, okay? So always remember to convert your image size into the actual size, because that distance is X number of millimeters, but also it's X number of micrometers as well at the same time. So for every millimeter on there, you'd have a thousand micrometers between each one, okay? 
and you'd have 100,000 nanometers for each millimeter, and so on if we went smaller and smaller. So that's a nice sort of overview of the, of the calculations. Another aspect that you might have to do uh, A-level is to um, do it in a practical sense. So with some microscopes, they actually have etched into the eyepiece lens a uh, eyepiece uh, uh, graticule which is basically like a miniature ruler, effectively, a miniature scale that's etched into the lens. We've only got one of them at our school. Um, and it would probably look a little bit like this. So you probably have zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, something like that. So what you would do is you would line up that eyepiece with your object looking at. So let's say I've got a cell like that. Um, I'd line it up and I would see that, oh yeah, it's about four units long. I could, I could do that more precisely, but for the purpose of this, let's say it's four units long. Now that's not the actual size, this is just a, a relative scale because, of course, as soon as you change your objective lens, the scale doesn't move, um, so that makes things a bit difficult. So what you would then do, once you've worked out how long it is on your eyepiece graticule, you would remove the slide that had your cell on it, and you would then place a stage micrometer. So that's a slide that's got effectively a little miniature ruler etched on it. In this case, instead of being in millimeters, it's in micrometers. And what you would then do is line up your stage micrometers with your graticule, and you would see, you know, something like 10, 20, 30, 40. And you would sort of line the two up. And like I said, mine was about four before. And I would say, oh yeah, look, it's, it's 37 micrometers long. So that's how you would do that. So you'd use a combination of the eyepiece graticule and the stage micrometer to find the actual size of the real object when you're using it in a practical sense. So bear that in mind. Um, the next thing I'll look at is the idea of uh, cell fractionation. So how do we actually uh, isolate and break open cells so we can look at all their individual organelles in general. Just a cheeky tea break, wet the old whistle. Better. There we go. So, cell fractionation this is about breaking open cells and then individually separating out different types of organelle. And it's basically split into two kind of key stages, but there is more detail for each, as it always is in biology. Um, First stage would be homogenization. That's effectively we're blending up our tissue sample. So let's say I want to look at um, the health of, say I've got a patient come in who's got some sort of liver disease and I want to look at the overall health of the mitochondria in his liver. Um, I would take a small biopsy tissue sample of the liver and I would basically blend it up. But if you started blending up tissues, you could actually cause some severe damage to the organelles. We want to make sure they're functional and are in intact. So you would place your tissue sample in a specialized solution before hitting the blender. Uh, in that solution, it would need to be cold, it would need to be buffered, and it would need to be isotonic. So I'll go through each of those ones in, in general. So the reason it's isotonic is it means it's the same water potential as the organelles. And that would prevent any water moving in or out of those organelles, causing them to burst or shrivel, via osmosis. So having it at the same water potential, i.e. isotonic, is, is, is preferred there. The reason I would have it cold, ice cold, is that would reduce the activity of any enzymes present. I don't, I don't necessarily want to stop them or denature them, but I want to prevent them maybe breaking down any of the organelles that are functioning, like my mitochondria. So having it colder will greatly reduce their activity. Uh, and then the last thing we do is make sure it's buffered, so we have it at a certain pH, and that buffer solution will maintain that pH in there, which could pretend any, prevent any denaturation of enzymes or proteins. So once you've set up your solution with your tissue, you would then homogenize it in a blender. You'd end up with a homogenate, which is the blended up material, and then you would filter it to remove any large cell debris and whatnot, any un unopened broken cells and things like that. Now we're left purely with organelles. But before I move on to the next part, a key bit to remember, when you're talking about any of these aspects here, remember we're, we're interested in the organelles, not the cells. We're gonna break those cells open. So think about specifically the organelles. So when we're talking about isotonic solution, 
it's the bursting of those organelles, not the cell. We're going to be ripping them apart anyway. So make sure you always refer to organelles there. That's very important. The next phase is, is an interesting one. We use a centrifuge. And what you do is you would take your filtered homogenate, put it in a centrifuge. And what a centrifuge base does, it spins super fast. And it will separate out the material based on its density. So what you would do is you would first do it on a, a, a low uh, revolution, or relatively low. And what that will do is it will separate out the larger objects. Now the largest organelles present in, in, in cells are going to be the nuclei. And they're going to be the first to separate out the bottom. So you end up with a little pellet of nuclei. Everything else, like the mitochondria, etc., will remain in suspension. So you could pour off that, what we call the supernatant, the liquid part. Um, so in this case, I'm interested in the mitochondria, so I'm going to keep that for later. And then I've got my little pellet of nuclei that I could either look at or discard as appropriate. You would then, if I wanted to say get the mitochondria, I would take that supernatant, spin it a second time at a faster rate, so it's revolving a lot faster, and now I'd end up with a little pellet of my mitochondria, which I could then take off the supernatant and I've got a little pellet of mitochondria to look at and investigate. If I did it for a third time at even higher, re uh, higher revolutions, I'd end up looking at lysosomes and stuff like that. So that's a really key little neat little way that we can actually uh, uh, break open cells and effectively sort out the individual organelles that we're looking for using these two different processes. So that is cell fractionation in a nutshell. So we're now going to look at our prokaryotic cell structure. Like I said, eukaryotic cell structure we've done in another video. So feel free if you want to pause it now and look at that one or wait until you finish this video. So prokaryotes, the name prokaryote means without nucleus. So bacteria have no nuclei. They also don't have any membrane bound organelles. So what do they have? Well, the first thing you'll notice on the outside is they have what's called a capsule, or sometimes referred to as a slime coat or a slime capsule. Probably best off to refer to it a capsule. Not all bacteria have these, but many do, and that actually helps them to mat together, to stick together. Um, and that's what's going on there. Uh, well, they also have a cell wall. Now, the cell wall is different to that found in plant cells. In bacteria, it's made of something called murine or peptidoglycan, if you like. Either or is acceptable in the exam. So they have that cell wall. They have a cell membrane, like all cells do. And that cell surface membrane is, is very similar to ours. They have cytoplasm, where all the chemical reactions are going to be taking place. They have various enzymes and proteins. Uh, in, in solution there. They have ribosomes, these are 70S ribosomes though, so they're a smaller version compared to eukaryotes which have the 80S ribosomes. In addition we also have um, these little loops of DNA called plasmids which contain some additional genes that the bacteria have. These are often survival genes, so a lot of the antibiotic resistant genes that are causing problems with things like MRSA are located on those plasmids. They also have their DNA, uh, it's loose in the cytoplasm um, and it differs from eukaryotic DNA, and I'll talk a little bit about this now. So some key differences between prokaryote DNA and eukaryotic DNA is, in prokaryotes, it's circular. So in eukaryotes, it's linear. So always make sure your statements are comparative. Um, it tends to be a lot shorter um, because it doesn't have any uh, introns in there. Whereas with eukaryotes, they do have introns and exons. So in the, in, the, in the case of bacteria, it's all functional DNA. They're also not associated with any histone proteins, whereas in eukaryotes, histone proteins are, um, are in association with the DNA. So it has got some similarities, of course. It's still got you know, all the same nitrogenous bases. There are phosphodiester bonds between the nucleotides. We have the same complementary base pairing. It's that universal genetic code's all the same. But in terms of the grosser structure of the thing is, is a little bit different. So there's a nice sort of overview of our prokaryotes and what they're like. And these were the sort of first proper life forms on the planet and they are still the most successful. Um, sometimes being simple is good. Okay then, so now we'll look at the viruses. Now these are uh, a very interesting and, and probably a very familiar sign to many of you at the moment. I'm sure you've seen many, many diagrams like this in the news of recent. Um, what are viruses? Well, that's a very good question, and I, I recommend that as a potential um, little research project that you could look at. Are viruses actually alive? There's a great deal of debate as to how they fit into the grander tree of life. Um, for the primary reason is they're unable to reproduce on their own. They require living cells, uh, host cells for them in order to reproduce. 
They do have genetic material, and that's located in the middle. Now, that can be in the form of DNA, or it can be RNA, depending on the type of virus. Um, it can even be single-stranded DNA as well. And the key thing to look out for, if you get some data there, you'll see that you won't get equal quantities of complementary base pairs. So if I looked at any organism from me to a grasshopper, there should be an equal proportion of adenine and thymine. Okay, because it's double-stranded, it should be equal. Whereas in a virus, you might see that the adenine and thymine are not equal, which shows you that it's single-stranded DNA, not double-stranded. Something to bear in mind. What else have we have got? Well, we've got this structure here called the capsid, which is unique to viruses. Um, sometimes they can have uh, this sort of lipo lipid membrane here as well. Um, and then these key structures here are called attachment proteins. And what they are used, they help the virus to recognise its host cell, to bind with it, and then potentially signal to that cell to, hey, let me in, or to trigger the virus to insert its genetic material. So some viruses wholesale enter the cell, or they just release their genetic material in. Once that genetic material is inside, your cells go, hey, it's DNA, fine, we'll read that DNA polymerase, we'll start to replicate it. Um, the, the DNA will get transcribed into RNA and then into proteins and we just start making our cell into a virus factory. It doesn't know what's going on and very quickly it's filled with viruses that which will, will eventually cause the cell to rupture, releasing you know thousands, millions of these viruses throughout the body and they spread. So they're, they're pretty, pretty nasty cell parasites really, but they are fascinating. They're very, very interesting as to their origins and what they really are. There's lots of it really um, cool research going into figuring out what actually viruses are and how they fit into the rest of life. So I would recommend that one, something to, to look into and research. So that's a nice sort of basic overview of our viruses. We've looked at the prokaryotes as well, previous video. Um, we've looked at eukaryotes. So the last thing we want to look at now is the cell cycle. So the cell cycle, this is all about the process by which a cell is preparing itself in readiness to divide and form two new cells. So each and every one of us started off as a single fertilized egg, a single cell. At your smallest, you were the size of a full stop. Now you've grown into great big horrible teenagers with trillions of individual cells, each of which have been formed through the cell cycle. So the cell cycle has three main phases. The nuclear division bit, we have to talk in a bit more detail. But the first phase is called interphase. And this is where mo the majority of your cells are, are in right now. They're in this kind of resting state. They're maybe potentially preparing themselves ready for division. So in order to uh, ready to divide, the cell needs to grow. It's got to get bigger. Um, and there's two really key important things that are going on. DNA replication and the replication of organelles. So the DNA is where the DNA will be fully uh, copied, so we end up with two sets of that DNA. So our identical copies can go to our two daughter cells, in the case of mitosis, or in the case of meiosis, the formation of gametes, we're gonna have genetic material ready for those daughter cells so they can be used to fertilize um, the opposite gamete. So inner phase is all about that kind of preparation phase. So remember, growth, DNA replication, Replication of organelles, really, really important. At this stage, DNA is not visible, okay? It's not in a condensed state. When we're getting ready for nuclear division, now there's two types of how we can divide our nucleus. We can either do mitosis or meiosis. In this video, I'm gonna focus on mitosis. Um, how does mitosis work? Well, mitosis is split into four key phases called P, I call it PMAP prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now I'll go through all those in a bit more detail in a bit. So mitosis is all about dividing up our nuclear so we end up with um, the full set of DNA for our two daughter cells. We end up with genetically identical daughter cells at the end. They're both gonna be um, diploid. Once the nucleus has been divided and we've got an equal quantity of DNA at both ends of our cell. The final phase of the cell cycle, which is the shortest, is cytokinesis, where effectively the cell membrane will begin to kind of pinch in on the cytoplasm and they'll pinch off and we'll end up with two separate genetically identical daughter cells. Okay, so interphase followed by nuclear division, in this case mitosis, and then cytokinesis. So we'll look at the details now of mitosis. Okay then, so mitosis then, so PMAT is how I remember it, 
P stands for prophase, M stands for metaphase, A stands for anaphase, and T stands for telophase. So prophase is right at the beginning. And what would you see? Uh, in prophase, what you would see is that chromatin starting to condense. We'd now see visible chromosomes inside the nucleus of our cell. Okay, the nuclear membrane will also start to uh, break down. So you'd actually see chromosomes in there. I'm going to try and keep this quite simple. So one pair like that. So what are chromosomes? One of the most common things asked. Well, they are two genetically identical sister chromatids joined together at the centrum mere. Okay, I'll repeat that. They are two genetically identical sister chromatids joined at the centromere and they're formed through DNA replication that has occurred back in interphase. So that's what we would see at this point. By the time we get into metaphase, some key structures have come into play. So we've got some centrioles here and what they're going to have done is they're going to start to produce spindle fibers, which are these long kind of protein like threads. And what they're going to start to do is arrange our chromosomes. They join at the centromere, that's very important along what we call the equator of our cells like that. So you'd see them kind of lining up now, visual kind of line up like that. So that's what you would see in metaphase. By the time you get into anaphase, our centrioles are still there. And what they have done is now they're starting to contract, they're starting to pull back. And they're actually going to separate, pull apart our, our chromosomes into the chromatids. I always think about like this, if you had <laughs> these sort of old-timey comedy shows and somebody's a bit rubbish on stage, they'd get that big hook on and pull you straight off. And that's what I think this looks like. So imagine you've got a chromosome sitting there, I am quite happy, whoop, and it gets pulled back like that, and you can see it being dragged off stage. And you'd see the individual chromatids looking a little bit like that, being dragged towards what we call the poles of the cells. Okay, so you'd see something like that. The final phase is called telophase. And this is where the DNA would then begin to start to um, un uh, unwind from those histones. It would, it would start to become um, it, it basically invisible again. And the nuclear envelopes will reform around the cell. So you'd, what you'd have is a cell that would appear like it's got two nuclei inside of it. And that's how you know that one's telophase. So bear in mind that you need to be able to visually recognise these things in order to answer exam questions and, and interpret data and so forth like that. When you're looking at something like cytokinesis, what you would see is, I always think it's about Garfield's eyes, you would start to see that those two cells are pinching off and there's my nuclei there and there. And eventually they end up as two separate genetically identical daughter cells. One last thing to mention about the cell cycle um, is often they often make links with with cancer. So what cancer is, is where one of, your, one of your cells has begun to divide uncontrollably. It doesn't know when to stop dividing. Now normally your cells will only grow and divide when they need to. So if I get cut or I'm growing or whatever, then, that will, then new cells will form to replace them. In the case with cancer, they don't do that. They will just continue, they will continue to divide. They want to outcompete your normal cells and they cause really harmful damage. I know it's quite upsetting. Um, so we need to be unaware how we maybe can interfere with this process to reduce cancer cell forming. So the first thing you would do to work out if you maybe have got something like cancer is you could do something like meiotic index and do work out that you've got a high proportion of cells in any of these four stages compared to interphase. If you've got a high proportion of cells in PMAP opposed to those in interphase, you know you've got a region of very active cell division, um, which is not normal in the majority of your body. It is certainly with cancer cells. So that would be a bit of a, uh, well, this could be, could be cancer, or at least a very active growing region. Now, what a lot of drugs, these chemotherapy drugs do, they try to interfere with mitosis in some way. And what they often do is potentially either prevent spindle fiber formation and that what that will do is it will prevent the chromosomes, chromosomes being separated into uh, 
into their chromatids and therefore effectively stop that cell from dividing, thus killing it. Unfortunately, these same medicines are not indiscriminate. They won't just affect cancer cells. They'll affect all rapidly dividing cells. And for example, your, ce your cells that form your hair follicles are rapidly dividing and of course they'll be very affected by these chemo drugs too. So one of the side effects of chemotherapy drugs is that you lose your hair. Um, it's killing the cancer, but it's also killing those cells at the same time. So that's why we get that kind of link in there. So be aware of that one as a possibility. All right, so that's not everything that's involved in the cell cycle. It's, it's a lot more detailed than that, but it's up to you now to hit the books and do a little bit more revision. So uh, this is Dr. P signing off. Stay safe, stay indoors. Make sure ensure you know enjoy your gardens if you've got them. I've been doing a bit of cheeky gardening this weekend. I've got some bark to lay down, but uh, you know you figure something out. All right, I'll see you later.